Hello, everyone. I am here today with the amazing Helen Gibson, a longtime client of mine who has so much wisdom to share from her own life experience, both her personal and professional journey. And so she's agreed to be interviewed and to share part of her experience with you. Um, and Helen, I think what I'll share to start us off is that you're a postdoc in Germany mm -hmm. and you've been studying history with a focus on Black studies. What else do you want people to know about who you are in the world? Oh, wonderful. Megan, I'm so happy to be here doing this with you. Um, I want people to know that I have a sort of an array of experience professionally. So I was really passionate about politics during the 2008 campaign and leading up to that. So I ran a Canvas office and I've always sort of jumped in headfirst in these new adventures. After that, I managed English language schools for adults in Nuremberg and in Munich after moving to Germany. And then I got back onto my academic track um, and have just finished my PhD studies here. Yeah, I think it's also important to mention that you have a very loving partnership with your partner mm -hmm. and also two beautiful girls. What do you want the viewers to know about your family? Thank you. Um, so I met my partner very long ago and we've spent almost two decades now building this partnership, um, which has been a beautiful journey and you've been a big part of coaching the last several years, which is really fun. So we got to know each other when I was 20, I'm 38 now, and I'd love to talk about what that, you know, transition in decades was like, what it was like to build a home together, um, to wait for a long time to have our first child together, and then to get ready to welcome our second child together. And we're sort of in between second and thinking about third child. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Very fun. Yeah. And I hadn't even thought to ask more about that, but, and wow, 20 years hearing yeah. you say that, I, I know that your partner has been like, I've heard about him consistently over our time together, but 20 years, that is so much knowledge and so much learning I'm sure has come through that. I, I can't even imagine. Yeah. yeah. So there's a few things, all, all of my clients I love and they're special, right? And mm -hmm. For you, I feel like there's some themes we come back to, and I want to dig into those for our viewers, because I think that whether you are an entrepreneur or a change maker in the world, these are so important. And I love how much you challenge the status quo, and you only challenge it because it's part of your values, like the vision that you have for your subject area, um, what schooling means, how it's done, like it's mm -hmm. all so thoughtful. And you're also great at self-care. So my question for you is, what sort of self-care does it take if somebody's going to consistently challenge the status quo? Amazing question, Megan. Um, so this is something I've worked on really conscientiously, and I think it's helped me to work on this in partnership with my partner. Um, but it's been a real process of learning first that sort of the sky's the limit in terms of our need for self-care and our right to have self-care and nuances of self-care. Um, you and I have made fun, which is an important part of self-care, a, a really big part of our coaching experience. And that's really important to me because it's one of my main goals in life, to have fun and to bring joy and have fun with others. Um, so I think that that is sort of where all of that impetus comes from, but it also comes from an ever more nuanced understanding, like I was hinting at at the beginning of what the possibilities are for that in practice. So for me, it's gone from meeting a lot of my basic needs in terms of like how I clothe myself, how I sleep, how I, you know, exercise. There's a lot of biking here to things like um, I've always enjoyed baths. This is a very particular level I wanted to tell you. <laughs> oh, to like allowing myself to just enjoy moments that are important to me personally, even if in a family context. And especially, and I think this is something you're hinting at in terms of challenging status quo, to really follow my passion and my intuition when it comes to where I'm going professionally and, and working with others. So self-care often means in that context, noticing when something feels really wrong, um, which is often the case in academic settings when you're sort of in an environment that's not supportive of let's say intersectionality as a method or of critical race theory. And 
understanding that you need to have the right people around you to feel supported and that that's good and okay. Um, and that with those people, you'll just develop more interesting ideas together and you'll be able to grow and it will be a obvious sort of direction of care that feels very different from something that is more, you know, drudgery based. <laughs> so the same goes for family. I feel like um, basically do things in terms of caring for family that are fun for me and meaningful for me. So a lot of shared meals, because that's fun and nice for the children. I also love being outside. So when we're on playgrounds, it's actually fun for me to be hanging out outside. Um, and I'm working right now and enjoying cooking. So getting more into like the nuance of putting together a meal that has more thought and preparation in it. Hmm. You touched on so many things from self-care around how we look and present in the world, like wearing the clothes that have us feel really good, really taken care of. There's all these studies that show that the way we dress impacts our personality. And so mm. I love that you're, you're pointing to that and choosing who you surround yourself with, being selective, creating self-care rituals that are not just supportive of you, but of your partnerships and your children and model the value of self-care for them. Because I just, I've watched you as you've upped your self-care and given yourself permission to have more self-care, how much that supported you in, in making these really big things happen. May I say something about that? Yeah. So just to be clear to maybe viewers about what that looked like at the beginning, when Megan and I had our first call, you asked me, so what is it that you'd like to do for yourself or, you know, what's meaningful to you? And the first thing that came to mind was I want my daughter, who was like one at the time, we were moving apartments to this one. I want her to be able to say no. And I was like, I don't know where that came from. That's a pretty basic need. But, you know, that was something that I was channeling through her and that I really meant emphatically. And so a lot of, you know, that early work was on that. Mm. And that's a great example of sort of where I was and what I'm working on now. Yeah. And just so people know, how old is that daughter now? She's almost eight. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> and how's her no coming along? Fabulously. <laughs> <laughs> very explicit she, she really understands herself um and she talks about like what it means to be open and to feel open about emotions and she likes processing sort of intellectually because that's her whereas her younger sister just came out saying no 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 and I'm trying to get her to do less <laughs> and you're like oh I manifested so a lot of no here <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful um and you're not just a change maker professionally, but also in your family. And you have found this wonderful way to balance your work as, as a postdoc with raising your two beautiful girls. So what tips would you give to other ambitious women who want to have both a thriving professional and family life? Mm, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think that's sort of the golden question. Yeah. Um, because you and I have also talked about the fact, and I'm really emphatic about this, that there's no magic answer. It's not like certain responsibilities go away and like sleep is always one of the answers. Like somehow you're gonna have to sleep. Um, I always have this thing about like, I need a certain amount of energy to be able to do both of these things really well um, to succeed in my career and to succeed in parenting in terms of being present and available. So I um, find prioritizing, I guess that is a form of self-care, but just prioritizing like eating and being fit and ready mentally. Um, and from there feeling like since I'm in a pretty communicative stage of our partnership, mine and Nico's feeling like we can support each other around lots of things. That's super important. It would be very different without that. Um, and then from there, I think that every stage of my career, especially in academia, has had a lot of give and take. Um, so there'll be times when I feel like right now, for example, um, I'm just kind of pouring myself in because opportunities keep arising. It's like conference paper here, hosting a workshop there, hosting a conference, getting ready to do other stuff. And um, luckily that often is in balance with my partnership and my partner in terms of caretaking, because that's really crucial. Um, but then at other times, I'll find myself more available for investing time and just playing with the girls. And I can genuinely say, I feel like I get a great amount of playtime in, and that's really, really important to me as a mom. Um, so again, the, the kind of time for each person being most important, and definitely different than 
quantity, but making sure that I feel like we're connected and like communication is really open and they can come to me for things that they need. Um, again, one is almost eight, one is three. And so this has been a lot about different phases and like waves of workloads. And then kind of trusting myself, I think the biggest step recently has been, okay, they're doing pretty great. I've given them a really solid foundation and they're really interested in my work at the moment. So they found out last week, I don't, I've mentioned it before, but they like found out that I'm a teacher and they're oh. like, oh my God, my mom was <laughs> What? We you just sat on the couch like typey typey all Corona time. Um, so that was really cool. I took them to my university um, and I'd taken Ella when she was younger, but because of the pandemic, it's been a while. And they thought that was all about ice cream and fun stuff. So they just think it's really inspiring to be around. And they're very supportive. Um, and that feels really important to me. Mm. You have found this wonderful balance of being able to honor everyone's needs because i think about how often you come to our calls and you're talking about your daughters and sharing updates about them and the ways that you've created family time and then you also bring these updates about how you chose yourself first can i share two examples yeah please i'd love to hear <laughs> yeah <laughs> one was you were coming home from something and i think you decided you were going to get off the train early and leave nico with the girls and you were going to walk home to have mm -hmm. some like exercise and you time and then mm -hmm. similarly you uh you were wanting to get more exercise and you were like well I'll take my kid, throw her in the like, you know, little kid thing that attaches to my bike and go bike around. And so yeah. like choosing you has been so inspiring to me and to see you do that. What, what concerns, fears did you have to overcome to start to strike that balance? Those are fascinating examples because they're very directly related to life coaching. Although I saw bike riding, which is again, a really important component of life here. I'm in Berlin as really important to um, sort of my, not just exercise routine, but emancipation physically in a, like I get to go out into the world and this is the way I'm doing it since. So um, when you and I spoke for one of our first sessions after that original call, I told you like, what do I love? I love riding my bike. And I went off, <laughs> I've told you this before, and I rode my bike so hard and fast to pick up my elder daughter who was then, yeah, we know how old. Um, and I fell off and that was maybe my worst fear. It was like, something horrible could happen. This used to be really impactful for me. What if I go out into the world and I fall or I don't succeed at something right away? So I skinned my knee and a lot of nice people came over. It wasn't a big deal, but because I was so close to the um, closing time of the daycare, I actually did have to go in like limping with a bloody knee. And she and I went to a doctor and I had, <laughs> like, it was totally fine. But that was sort of representative of the kind of energy I wanted to bring and not being quite, I felt prepared to like deal with that energy <laughs> in a productive way. I can't explain it. It could have been a total accident, but that was my interpretation. And um so what's been really unique and what's different about those stories since a lot of life coaching is I just have a lot more infrastructural support through a focus on care and partnership and support, support, support. Um, so that one story, I think it might have even been combined in this case, but we went to one of our favorite places on a weekend and I rarely would say like see ya to the family, but I did feel really empowered to say that recently and ended up having such a beautiful time because the one younger daughter slept the whole way home in her little bike trailer. And we ended up on a boat, which is like a little ferry going across a river in Berlin that felt so magical. And it happened to be in the party part of town. So it was just fun. I felt like I was out <laughs> and um, it felt like the total right decision. And then amazingly, cause that's how these things work out. I probably got home at the exact same time as, you know, Nico and my other daughter. So it was all great and that tends to be my experience like the things that I'm afraid of are somehow I'll I'm afraid that someone will be neglected which doesn't make sense if you're consciously thinking about it but still a fear and I think that comes from you know thoughts about my own experiences or I'm afraid that yeah I won't be able to make all of these ends meet and in the end people are sort of abundantly cared for and abundantly prepared to do their thing. Mm -mm. 
Yeah, so much about up leveling our lives is about up leveling our support structures. Yeah. And I've watched you really work on that and have the conversations. What, you know, what was the biggest aha moment about getting that support for you? I think for me, it was an exercise that I did for the group coaching that I did with you and Nephi. Yeah. You guys asked sort of maybe about some main support figures in my life. And I thought like, huh, I have problems with several of these people. Like they're things that really bother me about this relationship. It's either inappropriate on some level, like exploitative, or it's just not what I want, even in a professional setting Hmm. and, or it's codependent, even in a personal setting, you know? So just having that on paper and looking at it and being like, I recognize that after writing it down was really, really impactful. So that was about a year and a half ago. And that was a real moment where I realized, okay, I can see what this means for my relationship to asking for help. And then you two emphasized in that moment before we started really getting into the group coaching, which ended up loving, um, just what it meant to be like exquisitely supported and to expect that for yourself. Yeah. How would you say that coaching has supported your personal and professional endeavors? You've spoken a little bit about this, but what else do you want to share with those watching? Okay. So um, (laughs) it's been extremely helpful. Like I proselytize a lot. Um, I think because a lot of us are not really prepared to accept care and support at the levels that we could it's that simple it's just a really exquisite means of supporting yourself and thereby all the people around you so um I remember when you and I started working together I was earlier in my PhD career and I had these various goals that were pretty concrete like have a second baby improve my relationship to my partner have more fun and get going with my PhD And the get going part felt very um, difficult because I was totally like mentally able, but I had to actually go to archives because I'm a historian. And that felt like, how am I gonna do that and still be a good mom? It's across the ocean at this point, blah, blah, blah. Um, So having concrete support in planning was really helpful at that time. Mm -hmm. And all of those goals sort of like got me, you know, we leveled up in a lot of ways (laughs) with that. And then I found myself in this really interesting spot, having had that wonderful second child and being in a very different position and feeling inspired and supported, but still wondering, okay, what's next? And you ask me, what will it look like for you when you know, like, what will it look like to be a professor or to be a postdoc? And I was like, oh, I'll just feel it. Um, And you're like, okay, so you'll feel it. (laughs) Um, Which is so cool. I love your confidence that it was that simple, you know, and it it happened exactly like that. So within that year of coaching, I was like, I feel it. And I, I can honestly say in one of our conversations, like a week ago, I was probably saying, now I really feel it. Like I'm basically advising PhD candidates in my new role. I am in a totally different position than I was a year and a half ago. I lost a lot of the, um, not should I be here, but like, am I wanted here kind of thing. And that's huge. I think a lot of that came from our conversations around sort of less judgment of the world around us. So like shedding that really huge imposition that I was carrying around um, was very important. And so not only have I like had this child that I wanted to have that is a direct result of coaching and uh, my elder daughter is feeling really empowered um second one came out that way (laughs) I feel like in terms of professional goals um I have much more of a sky's the limit mentality so our very last conversation as you know was you saying quote (laughs) you have to think about it um so why is now the right time for you to start this institute that you want to start this was just a week ago and I was like why is now the right time okay here are like 50 reasons. And in the last week, I've really like talked to the people I need to talk to because all of the things that were fear-based before have sort of evaporated over the course of this work and this journey for me. Um, And since I already had a lot of confidence in my self-worth and the things that I know and bring to the table, that lack of fear and like lowering the fear threshold has helped tremendously. Oh, I love it so much. Yeah. What 
I just want you to brag about yourself for a moment. Like, what are you most proud of from this last year of your career? So I'm really proud of having done a lot of advocacy, like in the, you know, summer of the Black Lives Matter movement post George Floyd's murder, um, there was so much important activism happening everywhere across the globe, which was really, really important, but also just the beginning of changes that we're going to see all across the board in business and academia and society at large. And I've really appreciated being in a setting where I could speak my mind and share knowledge um, in a sort of activist sense, which was really important to me in my field. And that has led to really wonderful partnerships with people who do Black studies at a really high level um, and to do Black feminist theory and womanist, womanist theory at a really high level. And it's led to me understanding that it's really a appropriate to work in this context um, in all kinds of settings. So like at the institute level, at the university level, um, working in creating community agreements in my classes and showing professors in the States with whom I'm in contact and in Germany, this is what it looks like to really listen to students and to listen to them when they're saying, you know, we've been experiencing this kind of violence in a classroom setting and we want it to stop what are the steps that we can begin to take and then to think really broadly about what it means to listen to each other and to care for each other. So I think that's the ultimate direction that a lot of this is going in is like a lot of people are not prepared to be cared for because they haven't experienced that, you know, consistently throughout their lives. And when you say something like we demand a certain amount of care, for example, an anti-racist capacity, the pushback that sometimes comes is both racism and people feeling like we don't know what to do with this mode of communication or this mode of care. Mm -hmm. And it's been amazing to work with people who really know what they're doing in sort of breaking down those barriers and being able to show that this is beneficial for everybody and that this is really, really important as a mode of work. Um, so that's allowed me to create different kinds of syllabi I would say different kinds of relationships to students and colleagues to be braver in the way that I'm envisioning conference planning or planning mm -hmm. conferences and ultimately to want to do this institute where I think that a place like Germany and of course the U.S. could definitely use another critical theory institute centered on anti-racism where the main goal is talking about how to go about implementing these ideas um, so that seems important and it was really meaningful to me to have the kind of support I needed over the last year to understand my job is not just being a witness to the violence that I was a witness to in growing up in Virginia in my youth um, but also to um, know that I would be working in a different capacity hmm. and that I could bring something beyond sort of just you know making people aware who are not yet aware of what racist violence is, but to really move the conversation forward by um, helping, you know, get to different places and next steps in these settings, which I think don't have to be institutional settings, but that happens to be where I am now. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to see if that institute takes a life of its own, or if, you know, academic work start, starts to look different, mm -hmm. if it's more publicly engaged, for example. I imagine that what you needed to hear a year ago when all of this started, and anybody who's watching this, if you're just blown away by the things that Helen is up to in her contributions, you should be. <laughs> that is the appropriate response. But Helen, I imagine that a year ago, um, there are things that you would have loved. I imagine there are things you would love to tell yourself that version of yourself a year ago. And I think it's probably exactly what a lot of people who are on the precipice of contributing in a meaningful way need to hear. So if you could send some loving, encouraging messages back to that version of you a year ago, what would they be? They would be the kind of things that I got from colleagues, my favorite colleagues who have been so supportive and whom I've been able to support, um, which are like, you're really needed, your work is really needed. We understand you, keep going, um, there's a place for you. I think that it's it's really the like, there's a place for you and you can like through this new mode of care, create an environment 
that doesn't feel as antagonistic. You're not going to have to feel like you're fighting against something. And that's, I think, a really central tenet of a lot of life coaching. You don't need to be working in an environment where you're like, what am I doing here? <laughs> what, what are all of us doing here? Um, you know, it's really possible for you to set a lot of the conditions and to get the support you need to do something that's really intuitively and intellectually important to you. Sometimes it can seem impossible. I just had someone write to me about this the other day. I was posting about overwhelm and they said, this seems impossible. And I think that a lot of times people have told us it's impossible. We've told ourselves it's impossible. What we see around us in society has us think that it's, it's going to be impossible. And yet what I get from watching your journey and hearing you speak is it's about showing up consistently and always being willing to challenge those beliefs. It takes a lot of courage. So what has made it possible for you to challenge all those beliefs about what isn't possible in order to start creating a new reality? Mm. So I love new things. That's really important to me. And I feel so lucky that that's a part of me. So I've always loved school. I've always loved new beginnings. I've always loved fall. We're in fall right now. Um, so I think that I'm very hopeful and optimistic at my core, which is very helpful. Mm. Um, but I also have sort of developed a capacity to think in the present to a large extent. So a lot of what I'm doing, I've definitely experienced overwhelm within, let's say, the last week, last 24 hours, you know. Um, at the moment, I'm editing or sorry, copy editing a really wonderful book for a colleague. And that's the first task at this level with this press that I've done before. And it's really fun because I love the content it's also draining in the sense that it's not my everyday work and it's something I took on on top and I wanted to do on an unpaid basis so it's felt overwhelming as a task on some levels and I think that I'm really enjoying it and it's meaningful and important to me so I've let myself just be in the moment when I'm doing that task mm. and the things that have to wait have to wait and those things will be amazing when I get to them but that mindset is new like that's a real acknowledgement of the value it's again something I think you and I talk a lot about the value of the work that we're doing mm. recognizing the value of the work that I do to me means recognizing the time that it takes to do work at a really high level whether it's grading student papers or communicating um, with people in a conscientious way that just takes time so you can expect if you're going to really appreciate the outcome I might have to be in a certain zone and have to feel a certain way. And that doesn't mean like being irresponsible or not accountable to someone. It just really means being accountable to myself and what I know that I'm able to do. Um, which in this case, again, is focusing on a project, letting myself be immersed in it and then getting to the next thing next. And that recently has helped get me to places that I think a different mode of multitasking didn't allow for before. Mm. For folks who are watching this interview and saying, oh, I hear Helen's doing amazing things. I hear that coaching has been helpful, but I don't know if coaching is right for me. How do you think someone can know if coaching is right for them? I think that first conversation with you was really helpful because I had no idea what to expect. Mm -hmm. I have to say I'm from a sort of ableist family in that like therapy was not something that was ever condoned or discussed and coaching was something unfamiliar there was sort of a little bit of a maverick independent thing going on. <laughs> so it was really new for me to ask for support in this way. And I was so grateful to you for reaching out to me in the beginning in that context, we sort of had a mutual acquaintance and we were just starting out. But I, um, I would say, try it. In fact, I have to say, after a really successful working together one-on-one, -on -one, when you asked me to do group coaching, I was like, group coaching? <laughs> I'm horrible in groups, I think. <laughs> and I really couldn't picture it. I was like, sure. I mean, I know it'll be great because it's you, but what will that look like? And then I loved it. I loved the group of people, every single person, as you know, and I loved the mode and I loved having both you and Nephi. So mm -hmm. I think it's always about testing and I'm really an advocate of trying things. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Sign up for the first call. Just try it. You'll know pretty much always know at the end if I if it feels like a yes from my side and people pretty much know if it feels like a yes from their side. Yes, it's yes. that's the best way to do it. Um, that's so funny. I've never had anyone say that before, but yes. <laughs> like this interview, you were like, do you want to know the questions? No, I don't want to know the questions. So I'm trying. <laughs> I love it. And of course, there's a million different coaches out there. And I'm going to ask about myself in third person just because we're going to make yeah. a mashup. Um, there's a million different coaches out there. 
Um, it's really about finding the coach who's the right fit for you. Uh, who is Meg as a coach? Mm -hmm. Meg is exquisite. Meg is an incredibly caring, experienced, knowledgeable, joyful person who brings such presence of mind to each call. What I really love about her is that she always listens and then synthesizes information in a really incredible way and takes you in a direction that you wouldn't have expected. So it was really meaningful for me last time when you asked like, so why are you ready now to start this thing? Um, and I feel like you're so gentle in the way that you go about this. Um, you don't force it. And I've never felt like this was coming from you. You're just somehow exactly the really exquisite support I have hoped for and been lucky to find. Hmm. Thank you. We feel touched. <laughs> well, thank you, Helen, for sharing your journey with us, your wisdom. I feel like we could probably talk for another three hours. <laughs> An hour always flies by. So um, hopefully to be continued in a future interview. Thank you so much, Megan.